All right. Cartels. to go. Okay, everybody ready? Just one more thing to do. Not many people came today. Okay. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Sunday virtual feast. We got quite a few people already, and we're going to continue with our nectar of devotion study for the Sunday virtual feast. I think everybody. Let me just check. Yeah, you can hear me. And next week we're going to have a bigger program, and I'll announce that at the end of today's class. But we're continuing with our nectar of devotion study from the temple room because it is Sunday. And Sunday is the Lord's Day. <laughs> yes. So, all right, so, okay, we got that. Let me just put this on mute so people can't hear me. Okay. Jai, you wrote a Kunya be hurry. Jai who rod, who mad who va. Kunya be hurry. Gopi Jana Madaba Hiri Paradhari Gopi Jana Balaba Hiri Paradhari Yasulanan dana braja jano ranjana Yasulanan dana braja jano ranjana Yamuna tira manachari Yamuna te Rabana Chadri Jai Ran Humadhuva Kunjabi Hauti Jai Ran Humadhuva Kunna be Gopi Jana Balaba Yidi Bodded Hari Gopi 
Gopi Dana Bala Ba Giri Paradhari Yasunanandana Braja Janurandahuna Yasunanandana Braja Janurandahuna Jamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Radhumadhuva Kundavi Khaarti Jaya Radhumadhuva Kunjabi Hari Madhuva Kunjabi Hari Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahansa Paravidakacharya Also Tara Satishi Shimad His Divine Grace Abhaya Chanana Nabhaktivedana Gosami Shila Prabhupad Kijai Iskan Founder Acharya Shila Prabhupada Kijaya, Nantakoti, Voishna Vrinda Kijaya, Namacharya Shila Huridas Thakur Kijaya, Param Se Kaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nachinanda Shidwaiti Kadadha, Shri Vasadi Gauravakta Vrinda Kijaya, Shri Shri Radhakrishna, Gopi Gopadath, Shayam Kund Radhakunda Kiri Govardhan Kijaya, Vrindavanam Kijai, Maturadam Kijai, Jagadatha Sami Kijai, Yamunabai Kijai, Shimadi Lassi Devi Kijai, Sama Veda Bhakta Vrinda Kijai, Sama Veda Bhakta Vrinda Kijai, Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Bhav. All glories, the assembled devotees, all glories, the assembled devotees, all glories, the assembled devotees, all glories to Shi Guru and Gauranga Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Bo. Sanama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutle Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamit Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharani Nivashesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Dejatarani. So Om Magana Timidanda Shah Gananjana Shilakaya Chakshur and Biditam. Yena Tasmai Shri Gurveda Maha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torch light of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So we're going to continue with our study of nectar devotion. And for those who are online, have been following us. Oh, good, we got more. What's that? Get rid of what? Oh, what column? Hold on, I have to help. Oh, that, just go in the middle. Just take it in the middle and, and just press the left. No, go in the middle here. And press the left here. Go down. <laughs> All righty. So, before the nectar devotion, we chant this prayer to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, one of the prayers from the Goswami Ashtaka. Nada Shastra Vichara Naganipano Sadharma Samstapako Lokanam Hitakarano Tribuvane Manyo Shuranyakaro Radha Krishna Padara Vinda Pajana Mandena Matoliko Mande Rupa Sanatano Ragu Yago Shi Jiva Gopalako So we'll read the translation. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Gosamis, namely Sri Sanatan Gosami, Shi Rupa Gosami. 
Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. So we're going to read from the chapter, Spontaneous Devotional Service. We're halfway through the chapter. And there's two ways to understand Spontaneous Devotional Service. The uh, direct uh, Sanskrit for this is Raghunuga. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, for those of you who were listening to my class yesterday, there's two ways to understand the use of the word Raghunuga. Uh, anuga means to follow. So Raghunuga means one follows one's spiritual impulses or taste in devotional service. So the two ways to understand it is that if you say someone is on the Raghunuga platform, it may indicate they're on the higher stages of sadhana bhakti. Because sadhana bhakti, which is bhakti in practice, is comprised of two aspects. One aspect is vaidhi, rules and regulations, and the second aspect is raganuga, spontaneity. So in uh, the sadhana platform, which is the beginning platform, it's not like, it's a high platform, of course, all devotional service is a high platform, but it's a beginning platform of devotional service. So when we talk about Raghunuga Bhakti in the sadhana category, we're talking about like a little bit more advanced than just following the rules and regulations. In other words, one is still following the rules and regulations, but spontaneously. As we mentioned last night, getting up for Mangalarti spontaneously, not because they won't get prasadam if they don't get up for Mangalarti. We used to do that in the early days of the movement. That if you didn't get it for Mangalarti, no prasadam. Or maybe half a day fast. And if you didn't come at all in the morning program, full day fast. So that's called Vaidhi Bhakti. But in Raghunuga, you get up. It's like Prabhupada. Prabhupada was always up. Uh, Prabhupada wasn't on a lower stage, of course, but Prabhupada was spontaneous. So, and then also on the uh, sadhana mm, stage of Raghunuga, hmm. One is also beginning to recognize one's spiritual relationship. That is, whether one is in friendship relationship, Dasha Ras, Saki Ras, Vatsali Ras, or Maturya Ras, or the different relationships in the spiritual world. And then one begins to follow in the same mood as a particular resident of Vrindavan. So that's one understanding. I've just categorized or explained one understanding of Raghunuga. However, when one is a pure devotee, one also is experiencing Raghunuga. <laughs> but you're not on the Raghunuga platform because you're on the platform of Prema, but you're still following your rag. So it's, it's sometimes very confusing, this particular chapter of the Nectar of Devotion. You know, people are thinking, well, is it referring to one of the platforms? And, and probably goes back and forth in this chapter too, as you'll see. You know, sometimes, which we're gonna read today, uh, Prabhupada talks about, or Rupa Goswami in Prabhupada's commentary, uh, talks about the gopis, and other times he talks about someone who is following the rules and regulations. So the meaning of the word raganuga is someone who follows their rag, you know, their impulse or emotions or feelings uh, or nature like that. So, but when it's used as a particular level of devotional service, it's the higher stage of sadhana. Everyone understands that? Very, very important to understand that point. So sometimes it may be very confusing reason that reading this chapter. Now, and, and actually Raghunuga, the Raghunuga attraction or impulse or following that one feels can be categorized in terms of one's relationship or sensual attraction. Relationship means, you know, you have some particular relationship with Krishna, that impels you, I'm a Krishna's servant. That's relationship. Or I am Krishna's gopi. Of course, I'm, it's hard for me to say that, anyway. 
kind of look like one. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's relationship, you know, who I am. But sensual attraction means I hear Krishna's flute. You understand? So two things can be impetuses for the Raghunuga attraction to Krishna. Okay, so now we're going to read about the gopis. The lusty attitude of the gopis does not refer to any sort of sex indulgence, but it is actually a perver uh, sex indulgence of this world is a perverted reflection of the lusty attitude of the gopis. Duh. Srila Rupa Goswami explains that this lusty desire refers to the devotee's particular attitude of association with Krishna. Every devotee in his perfectional stage has a spontaneous attraction to the Lord. This attraction is sometimes called the lusty desire of the devotee. Uh, the lust is the devotee's excessive desire to serve the Lord in a particular capacity. So that's relationship, remember? I just mentioned that Raghunuga is based on two aspects of Raghunuga. One is relationship, and what is the other one? Does anyone remember? Starts with an S. No, don't remember. Sensual attraction. Food. Yeah, like Krishna's food. One is the relationship. This is what's being described here. Uh, the devotee's excessive desire to serve the Lord in a particular capacity. That's relationship. I want to serve the Lord. I want to cook for the Lord. I want to dress the Lord like the Pajaris. That's the Raghunuga that comes from the relationship. And from the sensual attraction, even for the uh, mm -hmm. practicing devotee would be, oh, I see Krishna and I want to hear his flute or something like that. That's it. So we're going to read, now we're just reading about relationship under the Raghunuga heading. I think it's really interesting. It's really important to hear these things described because sometimes it's extremely unclear if you just read here. I remember the first time I read Nectar Devotion, I didn't understand what was going on. The lust is the devotee. All right. Such a desire seems to be a desire for enjoying the Lord, but actually the endeavor is to serve the Lord in that capacity. For example, a devotee may be desiring to associate with the Supreme Person God, as a coward friend. He will want to serve the Lord by assisting him in controlling the cows in the pasturing ground. Remember, it's all relationship right here. This may appear to be a desire to enjoy the company of the Lord, but actually a spontaneous love, serving him by assisting in managing the transcendental cows. And that would be nice, wouldn't it? To be with Krishna like in the pasturing grounds and just like, wow. Can't think of anything better than that. All right, now we're gonna go on to sensual attraction. You have that there? What? Well, it's the next paragraph. It's, the heading is not there. On the, it's the extreme desire. You see that? The next, next paragraph starts off with the extreme desire. You see it? Go down. Uh, oh, no, actually, you have to go down because you you went backwards. The next paragraph begins with the lusty attitude. Go down. Go down, 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 the page down. Wait, hit it, hit it with the left key, yeah. And page, hit it with the left key. No, 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 not right there. Put the arrow in the middle. Hit it, hit the left key. Sorry about those headlines. Yeah, that's it. Page down to the paragraph that starts uh, this extreme desire. This page down. Did you find it? Wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop. Gotta go down, down, down. Whoops. Uh, anyway, why don't we just read? Anyway, 
the tenth canto, eighty seven chapter. Anyway, it's better you just read right now. Oh yeah, yes. It should be right now. Central attraction. Okay. All right. Sorry for those online. We had a little glitch here. All right, so now we're going to talk about sensual attraction, the heading of sensual, sensual attraction within the, the subheading of a spontaneous devotional service. Okay, maybe I should ask the question again. What are the two branches of spontaneous devotional service? Relationship and sensual attraction. Okay, good. Now we're going to read about sensual attraction. The other portion was about relationship. You know, when can I serve the Lord herding the cows? When can I serve the Lord holding the Lord like a little baby? When can I serve the Lord by dancing with him? Of course, if I was to dance with the Lord, I'd probably step on his feet. It would be <laughs> wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good for Krishna at this point. So <laughs> sens sensual attraction. That's why we don't want to be sahajas. Because if we actually project our material situation upon the realm of the absolute, it actually is funny. It's, it's stupid and it's funny. That's what the Sahajas do. You know, sometimes you've got these men uh, who put lipstick on their faces, on their lips, of course, and they think that they're going to be gopis. It just, it, it creates, it's a very humorous thing, but it's sad because people are imitating so this is sensual attraction. The extreme desire to serve the Lord is manifest in the transcendental land of Braja. And it is specifically manifested among the gopis. The gopis' love for Krishna is so elevated that for our understanding it is sometimes explained as being lusty desire. The author of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna's Kaviraj, has explained the distinction between lusty desire and the service attitude in this statement. This is very important. Lusty desire refers to the desire to gratify one's personal senses, and transcendental desire refers to the desire for serving the senses of the Lord. And I'm going to give an example of both in a second. In the material world, there's no such thing as a lover's wanting to please the senses of his beloved. Actually, in the material world, everyone wants mainly to gratify his own personal senses. The gopis, however, wanted nothing at all but to gratify the senses of the Lord, and there's no instance of this in the material world. Uh, therefore, the gopi's ecstatic love for Krishna is sometimes described by scholars as being like the lusty desire of the material world, but actually this should not be taken as a literal fact. It is simply a way of trying to understand the transcendental situation. And so let me, let me give an example of material lusty desire in relationship to Krishna. And of course, that's our old friend, Surpanaka. Everybody's heard of Surpanaka before. Serpanaka, for those who haven't heard, she's the lady with the long nails. That's what Serpanaka means. Uh, she saw Lord Ram and Lakshman in the forest, the Dandakaranya forest, and she was a Rakshasini. So she had the power to fly around, change her form at will. And when she saw Lord Ram, she became lusty after him. And this was not the same as the gopi's lust. So she landed, came in for a landing, and she changed her form to that of a beautiful girl. The only thing she couldn't change was her big belly. <laughs> That's described in the Ma part. And they were mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> she was able to change everything else except for the beer belly that she had. Anyway, so uh, anyway, so she comes before Lord Ram and says, you know, I really love you. Lust. It was just lust. I want to enjoy you. So that's not like the gopis are thinking that they want to enjoy Krishna, they want to give Krishna enjoyment. So anyway, so she, and Ram says to her that my brother's here, Lakshman, and uh, his wife is not here, you know. And I have a wife here, you know, it really wouldn't work out well for you. So she goes to Lakshman, and Lakshman says, if you have association with me, you'll simply become a servant because I'm a servant of my brother. So better you go back to my brother, and he'll soon forget uh, that thin-waisted lady. Because <laughs> Serpanaka had a fat waist. Anyway, sorry, challenged. So uh, anyway, so she goes back to Ram, and she discovers that they're just joking with her. And she gets really angry and envious of Sita Devi, and she goes to kill Sita Devi. 
And Ram says, Lakshman, don't ever joke with ladies again. And so Lakshman comes out and chops off different parts of her body. Ugh. And But she actually had a big nose, so, so she actually looked better without the part of the nose. <laughs> so anyway, so Lakshman comes out. And then, then she goes, of course, then she ultimately goes to her uh, brother Ravan and instigates him. But the point, um, the reason I'm telling this story is because that's lusty desire for Krishna, which is not spiritual. However, in her next life, she became Kubja. And when she became Kubja in Krishna's pastime, she also had that lusty desire. It wasn't a pure spiritual desire towards Krishna. And Krishna straightened up her back. And Krishna associated with her, and she became cured of her lusty desire by doing that. So, so that's the difference. So you can really see clearly with Kubja and with Serpanaka what it means to have a lusty desire, even relationship to Krishna. So you could, you could see the difference between pure devotional service and motivated devotional service, you know, wanting to enjoy Krishna, wanting to enjoy the spiritual master, wanting to enjoy the prasadam. Of course, we should enjoy it, but anyway. But then, you know, the enjoying spirit. You know, enjoyment is there. The gopis are certainly enjoying, but that's not their motivation. Their motivation is to give Krishna enjoyment. But they are enjoying. Even the feelings of separation are the topmost enjoyment. But the, there's no motivation there to do that. Whereas uh, Kubja and Serpanaka, their motivation was just to squeeze enjoyment out of Krishna. So try to understand that. Uh, this is actually, it's a very important point that uh, this uh, lusty desire of the gopis has nothing to do with self-centeredness. All other types of relationships are based to a certain extent or fully on self-centeredness. You know, even enjoyment in the mode of goodness, like today is very pretty outside, I went outside, I thought how pretty, but I was thinking, you know, how I am enjoying out here. Oh, it's so nice, I'm enjoying the cool breeze, I'm enjoying the sunshine. And then when it, it's raining or cold, I'm not enjoying. <laughs> so that, that is like a lust right there. So we have to be able to distinguish this lust from love. So, so someone like Prabhupada, all they're thinking of, has, they're not thinking at all about their own enjoyment. They're just thinking about giving Krishna enjoyment. It's amazing. I mean, I, it's hard for me to conceive of it, but it's actually their consciousness. Great devotees up to the standard of Uddhava are very dear friends of the Lord, and so they desire to follow in the footsteps of the gopis. So the gopis' love for Krishna is certainly not material lusty desire. Otherwise, how could Uddhava aspire to follow in their footsteps? And of course, Uddhava, not only did he want to follow in their footsteps, but he wanted to... Uh, that take birth as uh, grass or creepers in Vrindavan so that they would step on him, the gopis would step on him. And he did. Actually, there's a place at uh, Govardhan called uh, Uddhava Kund, where there's a very old temple that's called the Uddhava Bihari Temple, where a, actually a friend of mine runs that temple. He's, he must be about 90-something years old by this point. His name is Giri Raj. And his father did uh, 1,000 parikramas around uh, Govardhan to get him as a son. In other words, before having a relationship with his wife, he did went 1,000 times around Govardhan. And then he had this great devotee as a son. And uh, this devotee, he sits quite old, and he sits and reads Shastra and takes care of the uh, people come to take darshan every day. Pretty interesting. And Uddhava resides there on the grass in that area. Quite a special area. You're all invited to come when we're able to go to India. Uh, another instance is Lord Chaitanya himself. After accepting the sannyasa order of life, he was very, very strict in avoiding association with women. But still, he taught there's no better method of worshiping Krishna than that conceived by the gopis. Thus, the gopis' method of worship the Lord, of the Lord as if impelled by lusty desire, was praised very highly, even by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This very fact means that although the attraction of the gopis for Krishna appears to be lusty, it is not in the least bit material. Unless one is fully situa situated in the transcendental position, the relationship of the gopis with Krishna is very difficult to understand. Because their enthusiasm was just to please Krishna. And 
if something would please Krishna, even if it would make them miserable, they wanted to do it. So there's no self-interest at all. Other than the fact that their self-interest was perfectly dovetailed with the interest of the Supreme, but no self-interest as we know self-interest. But because it appears to be just like ordinary dealings of young boys and girls, it is sometimes misinterpreted to be like the ordinary sex of this material world. Unfortunately, persons who cannot understand the transcendental nature of the love affairs of the gopis and Krishna take it for granted that Krishna's love affairs with the gopis are mundane transactions, and therefore they sometimes indulge in painting licentious pictures in some modernistic style. In other words, they, they depict Krishna as very lusty, and they sometimes depict Radharani, you know, depicting her transcendental body in a very in improper way. On the other hand, the lusty desire of Kubja, actually Prabhupada talks about this, is described by the learned scholars as being almost lusty desire. Kubja was a hunchback woman who wanted Krishna with great ecstatic love, but her desire for Krishna was almost mundane, and so her love cannot be compared to the love of the gopis. Her loving affection for Krishna is called kamapraya, or almost like the gopis' love for Krishna. is like a reflection of the gopis' love for Krishna. But it was for her own desire. Now, of course, we understand that, before we go into the next chapter, uh, that practically all of us, unless we're pure devotees, are serving Krishna because something to do with ourselves, our own desires. So we have to be honest about that. You know, I'm serving Krishna because I like the taste of pakoras or something like that. <laughs> Which I haven't haven't eaten a pakora in how long? Like about 20 years. Anyway, I'm serving Krishna because, well, I get to play with all my computers and do all this cool stuff online. I'm serving Krishna because I get to travel, and now that I can't travel, I'm thinking of not serving. Anyway, <laughs> Krishna tests us like this. You know, Krishna tests us because sometimes we're serving Krishna for a particular reason, and Krishna takes away that reason, and Krishna just wants to see if we still want to serve him. Okay, so we'll go on to chapter 16. You have that there? Yeah. Spontaneous devotion further described. And here, there's more details about this. This is actually quite nice. We get into some of the rasas here. Relationship. In the attitude of the denizens of Vrindavan, such as Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, is to be found the ideal transcendental concept of being the father and mother of Krishna, the original personality of Godhead. Factually, no one can become the father or mother of Krishna. But a devotee's possession of such transcendental feelings is called love of Krishna in a parental relationship. In other words, you can't re really become the mother or father of Krishna because Krishna is never born. <laughs> but you can have the relationship of mother or father with Krishna. Although uh, ontologically, that's a big word, by the nature of Krishna and by the nature of us, we can never actually be the cause of the appearance of Krishna. The Vrishnis, Krishna's relatives at Dwarka, also felt like that. So spontaneous love for Krishna in the parental relationship is found both amongst the denizens of Dwarka, who belong to the dynasty of Vrishni, the Yadu dynasty, and among the inhabitants of Vrindavana. Spontaneous love of Krishna, as exhibited by the Vrishnis and the denizens of Vrindavan, are eternally existing in them. In the stage of devotional service, where regulative principles are followed, there is no necessity of discussing this love, for it must develop of itself at a more advanced stage. Now here, Prabhupada is making a reference to Vaidhi Bhakti. And if one is really into the rules and regulations, and you have pure devotees who are really into the rules and regulations, who never really uh, go to the stage of Raghunuga, like the uh, residents, hmm, uh, in the by Kunta planets, they're generally into just very very strict rules and regulations. Krishna's God, you got to worship him, behave yourself. There's like this story in the uh, Brihad Bhagavatamrita, where Gopal Kumar, who was a coward boy, went to uh, by Kunta, and he was ready to rush up to uh, the Lord and just like give him a big hug and kiss, you know. <laughs> you know, it's just. 
was really out of place. Actually, in the United States Congress, something just happened like that too. One of the Congress ladies hugged one of the men. <laughs> Completely out of place. So in the same way, uh, that's because they are actually on the platform of rules and regulations. Or let's expand that a little bit more. They're on the platform of awe and reverence, appreciating God. You know, we have to worship God. This is our service. Instead of just like throwing all caution to the winds like the residents of Brindavan do, and they have a very thick and thin relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, so Prabhupada here says, following Rupa Goswami, there's no necessity of discussing the love, uh, hmm, this love that is referring to those who follow just regulated principles, for it must develop of itself at a more advanced stage. So we are meant to, at a certain stage, advance to a spontaneous platform, not just rules and regulations. But that doesn't mean we give up the rules and regulations. It means we follow the rules and regulations, as I mentioned before, spontaneously. And we also follow the rules and regulations for the reason of setting what? A good example for others. As Krishna says in the Gita, yad yada charity, shreshtas tat tat eveturo janaha. Very important point here. So eligibility for spontaneous devotional service. So if you want to become spontaneous, that is, if you are already following strictly, persons is up to follow the footsteps of such eternal devotees of the Lord as the Vrishnis and Vrindavan denizens are called Raganuga devotees. Now here Prabhupada is referring to the stage of Raganuga, which is the higher stage of Sadhana, remember? So Prabhupada is act, essentially Prabhupada is flipping back and forth between you know the eternally liberated devotees and those devotees on the higher stage of sadhana practice. These Raganuga devotees do not follow the regulated principles of devotional service very strictly. Uh, in other words, they don't follow them, but they automatically follow them. They're not following them for rules. They're not, and they're not breaking the rules either. It's not that, you know, okay, now I'm on the Raganuga platform, uh, bring out some marijuana or something like that. <laughs> Help me meditate better on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But they want to follow strictly. I mean, that, like they only eat food cooked by devotees because they have an attraction for Krishna. But by spent, spontaneous nature, they become attracted to some of the eternal devotees such as Nanda Nishoda, this is what we mentioned before, and they try to follow in their footsteps spontaneously. There's a gradual development of the ambition to become like a particular devotee, and this activity is called Raghunuga. So that's the, the other definition of Raghunuga right here. So in other words, let's say they see, let's use Daruka, one of Krishna's servants, who fans Krishna. You know, he fans Krishna in different ways. So they just become uh, enamored by the way he's fanning Krishna, just thinking, I wish I could help him. Not that I want to become Daruka, because that's also impersonalism. But I want to help him fan Krishna. I also want to assist him in that particular endeavor. Maybe bring him, maybe bring him the fan. Oh, Rishikesh. Maybe bring him the fan or wash his feet. You know, serving what's called the ragatmaka devotee. Now, that's another term that's important to understand. A ragatmaka de devotee is an eternal liberated associate like Subal, like Sudam, like Duruka, like Ashodamai, uh, like any of the mm, close gopis, the Astasakis. Uh, and they are called Ragatmaga devotees, and also Rupa Mandri and Guna Mandri and all those other devotees too. They're Ragatma, that means those whose Atma is Rag, or attraction for serving Krishna. They're very soul. You can't separate it from their very being. In other words, they have no separate identity other than their Rag. And Raghunuga is someone who follows one of those Ragatmaka devotees. Anuga means to follow. Very important to understand. So there is a gradual development of the ambition to become like a particular devotee, and this activity is called Raghunuga. We must always remember, however, that such eagerness to follow in the footsteps of the denizens of Braj, Vrindavan, is not possible unless one is freed from material contamination. Here's the caveat. A prerequisite. In the regulated principles of devotional service, there is a stage called 
anarta nivriti, which means the disappearance of all material contamination. Sometimes someone is fa found imitating such devotional love, but factually he is not freed from anarthas or unwanted habits. It has been seen that a so-called devotee proclaims himself a follower of Nanda Yashoda or the gopis, while at the same time his abominable attraction for mundane sex life is visible. Such a manifestation of divine love is mere imitation has no value. When one is actually spontaneously attracted to the loving principles of the gopis, there will be found no trace of any mundane contamination in his character. That's interesting. So, you know, maybe we can relate it to that verse in the Upadesha Amrita. Vacho Vega Manasakrota Vegam Jiva Vegam Udhrapashta Vegam. That one is able to uh, tolerate the pushings that come just from having a material body. Just like sometimes, you know, pure devotee may be hungry, but he, control he tolerates it. Because just having a physical body, there's certain pushings and pullings that come. Anger. <laughs> uh, tongue, belly, genitals, mind, anger, and words. So this is a very important pre pre prerequisite. Therefore, in the beginning, everyone should strictly follow the regulated principles of devotional service according to the injunctions of the scriptures and the spiritual master. Only after the stage of liberation from material contamination can one actually aspire to follow the footsteps of the devotees in Vrindavan. So in other words, let me give you some hope. <laughs> Even if you're feeling, you know, the impulses, but if you're able to control them and not give in to them, then you're actually freed from material contamination at that point. If you can be sure, 100% sure, that you're not going to give in to your impulses. Because the body will naturally have impulses. Like I said, you still have, you still have your, uh, all your different aspects of the body, you know. You get thirsty, isn't it? You get thirsty, you get hungry, you know, so, oh my God. I remember in the old days, nobody would drink water in the temple. <laughs> and now it's become, everybody needs their own bottle. Yeah, when I joined the movement, nobody would think of like bringing in these. Yeah. How do you know? Now you're older. We can do it. So... <laughs> What get, uh, so anyway, so, so there is hope. If one's able to uh, tolerate the pushings, you know, vacho vega manasakrota vega jiva vega udra pashta vega, and know that they're not going to give in to them and be engaged in Christian service using the intelligence, it's called buddhi yoga, then you can begin to think about the Raghunuga platform. It is said by Srila Rupa Goswami, when one is actually liberated from material contamination, he can always remember an eternal devotee of Vrindavan in order to love Krishna in the same capacity. And developing such an aptitude, one will always live in Vrindavan, even within his mind. The purport is that if it is possible, one should go and physically be present at Brajabhumi, Vrindavan, and be engaged always in the service of the Lord, following the devotees in Brajadam, the spiritual realm of Braj. If it is not possible, however, to be physically present at Vrindavan, one can meditate anywhere upon living in that situation. Wherever he may be, one must always think about life in Brajadam and about following the footsteps of a particular devotee in the service of the Lord. So that's why devotees, or Prabhupada had devotees go from time to time, not stay in the Holy Dham, to go to the Holy Dham because it, it uh, cements an impression in your heart, in your mind, so that you're always thinking about it. I know Aditya would go every year for the retreats, right? And that and now, you know, now you're feeling like lamenting that you can't go this year. All of us are thinking, and, and actually I'm planning out, not, not to go, but I wish I could go. Uh, I'm planning out how on the particular days that we're celebrating during Kartik to do some presentations with pictures, you know, about Brajmando Parikama so everybody can get the opportunity to go on a Brajmando Parikama. But it's important to go at least once in a lifetime. Uh, like the Muslims, you know, they go, isn't it? And they go to the Kaaba at least once in a lifetime. That's a rule for every Muslim uh, to go Mecca, Medina, to do this whole Hijira once in a lifetime. Because it, it cements 
their relationship with Muhammad. You know, how he went to Medina and then he came back to Mecca and conquered Mecca. So it really, it's important. Or you have the Jewish people where they go to Jerusalem and the Christians, uh, they go to Bethlehem. And it really cements their whole uh, concept of devotion, a personal concept of devotion. Because personal concept is very important. And then so when you go to the Braj Mandal Parikrama, you actually hear about what Krishna did in each place. And it's simply amazing you hear like, and it, it actually brings Krishna, I wouldn't say down to earth, but really into the forefront of your consciousness. You actually see where Krishna slid down the hill with his friends. You know, there's actually a slide somewhere where Krishna slid down the hill. You see where Krishna danced on the heads of the Kaliya serpent. You see where Krishna ate uh, the dirt and Mother Yashoda chastised him, Brahmananda got. Uh, you see where Krishna did his rasa. I mean, you see all these things. And it, it's something that really, anyway, is the foundation of your devotional service to see these places. So a devotee was actually advanced in Krishna consciousness who is constantly engaged in devotional service, should not manifest himself even though he has attained perfection. This is actually an important point. The idea is that he should always continue to act as a neophyte devotee as long as his material body is there. In other words, he makes believe he's a neophyte devotee to set a good example for others. Activities in devotional service, maybe if they need any help with that, you can see if they need help. Activities in devotional service under regulated principles must be followed even by the pure devotees. Here, so here's Prabhupada's statement that the pure devotees even have to follow regulated principles. But when he realizes his actual position in relationship with the Lord, he can, along, along with the discharging of regulated service, think within himself of the Lord under the guidance of a particular associate of the Lord and develop his transcendental sentiments in following that associate. In other words, externally, you're acting just like you did before and nobody can tell the difference. You're just acting like you're a neophyte, getting up for Mangalarti, eating prasadam, <laughs> of course eating prasadam, <laughs> managing the temple, managing your GBC zone. And you just like make believe, you just make believe that you're down on earth, you know. <laughs> In this connection, one should be very careful, should be careful about the so-called Siddha Pranali. The Siddha Pranali process is followed by a class of men who are not very authorized and who have manufactured their own way of devotional service. They imagine that they have become associates of the Lord simply by thinking of themselves like that. This external behavior is not at all according to the regulated principles. The so-called Siddha Pranali process is followed by the Prakriti Sahaja, a pseudo-sect of so-called Vaishnavas. So now I'll explain that in a second when I finish this paragraph. In the opinion of Rupa Goswami, such activities are simply disturbances to the standard of the way of devotional service. So Siddha Pranali basically is a process by which a guru or someone who's acting as a guru or someone who may not even be qualified to be a guru, but someone who basically makes believe that you are on a higher platform than you were on and he tells you who you are in the spiritual world and uh, what's called the Ekadasha Bhava, the 11 aspects of your personality in the spiritual world, what you look like, the color of your dress, you know, what your service is. That's called Siddha Pranali. And you'll find that, I mean, that if you're a pure devotee and if your guru is a pure devotee, yes, in that case it may be applicable. <laughs> but. This is not something that is allowed by Srila Bhakti Sananta Saraswati Thakur, nor by, of course, nor by Srila Prabhupada in this Siddha Pranali process. So anyway, so, the, so we find many devotees get cheated by this particular so-called procedure. They go to Radhakund and they find a Babaji who tells them, I know who you are in the spiritual world. And the reason you're not advanced in devotional service is because your guru is not advanced. You can only advance as much as your guru. Ooh. Yeah, that's the reason I'm having all these material desires. It's my guru's fault. 
Kind of funny, isn't it? So, uh, but now I will give you this mercy. Close your eyes. You are Gopi, and your name is, uh, let's find some Monday night, Susie Gopi. <laughs> no, Bollywood Davy Dossie. Anyway, so, you know, they, they don't do it crazy like that, but, you know, but they give some name of the Gopi, and, and your service is doing this. So once upon a time, there were a bunch of devotees who approached one of those Babaji's, and they got that Babaji initiation from him, whatever it was, Sinapranali. And then they compared uh, notes with each other afterwards, and they found out they all had the same name <laughs> in the spiritual world, the same service. So it's a good business. You know, I, I could do really well for myself if I would do that with devotees. You know, just say, you know, look, I'm going to tell you, Punjabi Bihari, I'm going to tell you who you are in the spiritual world. The reason I gave you the name Kunji Bihari, because you're really Kunji Bihari Mandri. <laughs> in the spiritual world, you're a young girl, about 12 years old, and you help with the Radha and Krishna and the Kunj, you know, in the bushes of Vrindavan. So you should meditate on that while you're chanting Java. Anyway, no, don't. Do that so <laughs> they do stuff like that. I'm not just joking. And very sentimental people, they get trapped. You go to Radhakund, Shamakund, and you will find a whole bunch, especially Western people, actually a lot of Russians. You'll find a whole bunch of people there and they're gopis, you know. Anyway. Sure don't look like gopis, but they're gopis. So <laughs> Anyway, so you got to really be careful. Prabhupada cautioned, at one point, Prabhupada said, nobody should go on Prikama around Vrindavan unless they're guided by an older, advanced devotee with them. Because it's very dangerous. You can get misled very easily. Srila Rupa, got, we're going to finish this, this section up and then we'll take questions, maybe. Yeah. Srila Rupa Goswami says that a learned acharya is recommend that we follow the regulator principles even after the development of spontaneous love for Krishna. According to the regulator principles, there are nine departmental activities as described above these Nava Bhakti, and like beginning with hearing, chanting, remembering, as described above, and one should specifically engage himself in the type of devotional service of which he has a natural aptitude. That means if you're good at chanting, if you're good at hearing, if you're good at serving, Hare Krishna, good to see you. Uh, and then you do that. You're good at addressing the deities, you do that. Uh, whatever, you're good at managing, good at business, you do it for Krishna. For example, one person may have a particular interest in hearing, another may have a particular interest in chanting, another may have a particular interest in serving in the temple. So these are any of the other six different types of devotional service, remembering, serving, praying, engaging in some particular service, being in a friendly relationship or offering everything in one's possession should be executed in full earnestness. In this way, everyone should act according to his particular taste. That's a, that's a good instruction for us. So, any questions about anything we said in class? Yeah. Um, when I know you say that when people are in the Raja Yuga, back in Yuga stage, they still follow the rules. Yeah. Even though they are. Yeah. So, like, what does it look like actually? Like, they would come to Mangala, like, when yeah. you, which happens, they would come to Mangala RP because they, they really felt they like They want to. And, like, every day they would feel like it, or, like, maybe some days they would be doing something else. Well, some days, they, you know, depending on what Krishna wants. You know, Raja, I'll give you an example. Just like we have, anyway, a young couple here that's getting to know each other. And they're always together, and they look forward to being with each other. That's Raganuga, but it doesn't end. It's not like, sometimes, anyway, there's this song in America uh, about a boy and a girl spontaneously well, I'm not going to sing, I guess, getting to know you, you know. So, uh, in the material world, 
in the beginning stage, there's this like, wow, rush. And then after a while, it settles down to uh, just normal life and then boredom. <laughs> and then you're just doing it at, actually, 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 this is really interesting. I just thought it was something really funny. That material relationships are like, you know, you got spontaneity in the beginning and then regulated principles afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I never, th I never thought about it before, but you know, like you and you first get married or plan to get married, it's just like stars in your eyes, like oh, this pretty girl or handsome man or something like that, and then you just stay with the person because that's the rules and regulations, you know, out of dharma. <laughs> so it's actually, <laughs> isn't that true? I mean, it's like the opposite. In Krishna consciousness, is you start with the regulated principles, and after a while, it's spontaneous, you know. Like, like eating, so, you know, eating is spontaneous when one's hungry. But let's say if you were hungry, here's another example, interesting example. Let's say you were like uh, mm, Kumbhakarna. You don't know Kumbhakarna. He was a big guy, and he, a really big guy, and he would eat so much there wouldn't be any food left over for anyone else. So he had to get the benediction. Ultimately, the first benediction, he was going to sleep forever, but then his brother interceded, and he only woke up every six months to eat. So he had insatiable appetite, or even Beam Saint, but Beam Saint wasn't that bad, like Kumbhakarna, that it's just someone who's always hungry. That's what it means to be in Raganuga platform. Is that, that's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> someone who's always, you know, talk about lust. You know, with a lusty desire to serve Krishna. It's always just like intense. Or like greed, you know, intense greed to have something. I must have it, I must have it. You know, see the little kid sometimes who was asking for something and he throws a fit. So imagine if that fit went on for his whole life. And that's Raghunuga Bhakti. <laughs> I must have it, I must have it. That's lolium uh, or intense greed. Anyway, so does that answer the question? <laughs> it's actually funny that just thinking about how relationships in this world start with Raghunuga and they end with Vaidhi. <laughs> Did you ever think about that before? Yeah, it's a banyan tree, the upside down banyan tree for the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> it starts with Raghunuga. <laughs> that is so. Interesting. So, uh, Rishikesh. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's why it has to be confirmed. Yes, because out of the devotee's humility, one will think that I'm not qualified. That's true. So therefore, it has to be confirmed by higher authorities. You know, one reveals their mind. That's the principle of uh, guyamakyati prachati, revealing the mind in confidence. You know, I'm feeling this attraction for, you know, for whatever. Just like I give the example of when I first took up Krishna consciousness, you know, I felt the attraction to be a coward boy, but it was very premature. It was like the first day in the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> It was because, you know, I had joined the movement with some friends who happened to join like two days later than me. And we were just like buddies and we were taking care of cows before. So therefore we projected our material consciousness or activities upon the realm of the absolute. And then uh, we thought like that. So obviously if I had gone to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, you know, I think I'm a coward boy. <laughs> Prabhupada would say, do something practical. You understand? So, therefore, where we reveal our minds, that's why we need the association of advanced devotees. We reveal our minds, and then advanced devotees can tell us, you know, hey, wake up, smell the roses, so to speak. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, that's how you know. But uh, naturally, a pure devotee will think, like Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his poem uh, Gopinath. Gopinath, Mamanibeda Nashuno, 
Vishaya Durjana. I'm a materialistic rascal. So a pure devotee thinks like that. You can't. A pure devotee is not thinking, hey, I'm a pure devotee. I got it made. You know, ready to roll here, you know. <laughs> Bring it on, you know. <laughs> I think the more you advance, hopefully the more humble you get. And the more you understand that you don't understand. Actually, there, there's that statement. Who is it from Lord Shiva or, or Lord Brahma? Others may say they understand Krishna, but I don't, you know. Nar, I, they, I think there's some statement like Vyasa may understand or he may not, you know. I forget the exact quote there. Yeah, Lord Brahma. I think it was Lord Brahma who said that. So, uh, you know, that's the humility of the devotee. And how can we actually understand Krishna anyway? He's an Nanta. He's unlimited. Even uh, Ananta Shesh can't understand Krishna. And he has unlimited head, so what to speak of us. Okay. Any other questions from anybody here? Yes, there's a prayer. Yeah. But what my question is ultimately since um, in Kali Yuga the main method of sacrifice is um Sankirtan. Sankirtan. So aren't we in order to actually come to these higher states of devotional service, don't we already yes. take seriously? Well actually I I did mention when I was describing Nabha Bhakti and yeah. nectar devotion that hearing is essential for everything. You can't do any of the other processes without hearing, because if you don't hear, you won't know how to serve, you won't know how to remember, you won't know how to serve the lotus feet, you won't know how to become a friend of Krishna, you won't know how to surrender everything to Krishna, you know, unless you hear. So here is the, hearing is the absolute essential item of all the uh, nine processes of devotional service. And of course, when you hear, you naturally chant. I mean, you can't avoid chanting when you here and then you naturally remember. I think Shravanam Kirtanam, Vishnu Smaranam, I would say had to be done by everybody, those th first three processes. And you can't do any of them without doing all three, especially in Kali Yuga. Shravanam Kirtanam, Vishnu Smaranam, and then you could do Archanam, Vandanam, like Sakyams, like this, Padasavanam. Okay. I think we had just one announcement for all of you online, and uh, next week we're going to have a, uh, hopefully if the weather holds up, a festival here beginning at 5 o'clock. It's, I don't know what it is, but anyway, <laughs> it's a celebration, uh, what's called the Vyasa Puja. So that's going to be at 5 o'clock next week. Hopefully we're going to do it outside so we can have more people here, and everyone depending on the weather. Everyone's invited to come, and we're going to be having it online, of course, on uh, Zoom and on Facebook. But uh, maybe an opportunity or the last opportunity uh, during the good weather time for everybody to come and physically be here. There'll be a feast and some other things like that. And that's just for those of you online. That is just for the devotees in the United States. And those devotees in Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji, uh, that's going to be at a different time on Tuesday online, which is going to be 3 o'clock in the morning, our time here. Don't remind me. 3 o'clock in the morning, our time here. Um, 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday in uh, the Brisbane area. Mm. And that same state, uh, 6 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday the 27th. We're talking about the 27th. Tuesday the 27th in Sydney and in Victoria, New South Wales and Victoria and Australia. Uh, all right, 6 o'clock. 8, 8 o'clock in New Zealand, 8 o'clock p.m. in New Zealand the 27th. Uh, and 7 o'clock in Fiji. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Forgot about Europe. 
So Europe, Europe is going to be uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock Central European time. India will be, let's see, 3 and, three and 9, uh, 12.30 and midday, 12.30 midday. Yeah, perfect time except for here. What? Is what? The 27th of this month. That's, uh, yeah, n not this coming week, but the next week after that. But that's, uh, but for everybody here, all you have to do is remember Sunday at 5 o'clock. Everybody in America, Sunday at 5 o'clock, Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Daylight Time, to be more precise. And for those overseas, it's a separate program for them, which will be at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I don't expect anybody except for me to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, that's to give the op devotees overseas the opportunity, because they're all locked in right now. Uh, in many countries, well, in Europe, the uh, virus is increasing dramatically. In Australia and New Zealand, it's actually gone down, because they're pretty much completely locked out. They were locked down, and now they're opening up. In New Zealand, there's sometimes they go a week or two without one case because they're an island country and they can isolate themselves from the rest of the world. Fiji is the same thing. Okay, on that happy note, we'll see everybody next week at five o'clock and we'll have the festival here and also online. All glories to his divine grace, Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, Ki Jai.